Merry Christmas. Coming up close, you guys get your shopping all done? No? That sounds like a no to me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We, we already celebrated half of our Christmas. We celebrated Thanksgiving. Many of you guys know my brothers were able to come over and we were able to do that. And, and uh, Monday, Christmas Eve, we liked it. We liked it. I don't know if you've heard any of my parents' stories, their, their travels and, and, and holidays. It's, it's never rest. It seems like it's never restful for them. They always just all of a sudden just pick up and go and choose to go. And we're, we're deciding, you know what, we want to liven things up this holiday. So we're going to travel Christmas Eve, right? Airplane, go into an airport, have all that fun stuff take place. And, and that's what we're going to be choosing to do. So um, the Monday after, so I think that's the 24th. So next Sunday is going to be the 23rd. So we're going to be traveling. So just be in prayer for us there. That will be amazing. But we're going to move. We, we've been talking about um, being the salt of the earth, that you and I are salt. And that was our series. We just ended last week. And, and we're going we're gonna to kind of have some Christmas sermons and Christmas messages. So this morning, if you would turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 2, we're going to begin there this morning. And then I'll read from verses 1 to 12, and then we'll pray and kind of get going this morning. And, and it just, I don't know right now, but as of right now, it seems like it might be a little bit of a shorter message. Um, we will have goodies in the back, though, because that is in, in hopes and in kind of pressure that you guys will help us be able to set up the chairs and table for tonight so we don't all have to do that. Amen? We're a church family. We're excited about tonight, excited about the gift giving. It'll be fun and entertaining. And, uh, and let's, pr- let's, let's read first. It says in, in verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, And we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah, For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for this time that we get to gather together as as a local body here at Hope for the Nations to, to celebrate the hope of all humanity. Your Son, our Savior and Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord, that, that it inspires that it empowers us, that, that, it, that it gives us revelation as Holy Spirit enlightens it to us, into our spirit. So we ask that you would bring revelation into our lives, that you would continue to change and mold us into your image. God, I ask that you would anoint me to speak what you've given me, that you give me clarity. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. I know for many of us, when... Uh, um, I, actually, let me begin with last week. Last week, I think I kind of started going off a little bit before um, I spoke on the finale of the, the salt covenant and, and speaking of salt and speaking that God is a covenant God about, about our lives, um, how we kind of sometimes in holidays and other events like that, like birthdays, that we kind of come into life with low expectations, 
we have these low expectations because of certain life experiences that we have, that we have um, come across and certain things that have happened in our lives. And, and when we are kids, there seems to be so much glitz and glamour when there's a birthday or when there's a holiday or when there's Christmas. And there's a level of excitement that takes place. And it's almost like I can't take it anymore. And I know that many of you guys were children that looked and snuck into those presents and opened them up craftily so you could actually see the next day what you were going to get. But for some, oh, someone's already get, getting guilty. Praise the Lord. Conviction right here. Praise the Lord. But anyways, that we have once had that level of expectation, that level of anticipation, but through the years, something has taken place in our lives. Almost that we have become um, um, just accustomed to the ordinariness of life. That is something that, that seems to have overtaken our culture that we just continue to go through the ordinariness of life. We continue to go through the certain routines of life that, that we get up in the morning and we, we go off to work or we go to school and we do our thing out there and then we come home and, and either rest, eat a meal or two and then we, then we go back to bed and we kind of start everything back over again the next day. Until, of course, we retire, and then we have to kind of form another routine for that pattern of life. But, but that we kind of just make up these routines of life, all, all, all the way knowing that we're just going to do everything that we've expected to do. Something that is just a routine. And, and I think that that can also be placed on our church life. Going to church, doing the same routine over and over again. Knowing what to expect, knowing what is asked of us, knowing what is going to take place. And I don't think that that is really what the Christian life is all about. I think that God is wanting something more, something to be able to do in our lives that breaks us out of that mundane life, out of the ordinariness, out of the routines of life to where no longer our low expectations are what we're looking for and what is going to continually happen, but he wants to do something new in our life, something amazing. Do you, can you say amen? amen? Amen. The Bible says that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And when I read that scripture, I don't think that that's just an ordinary life. I don't think that is just a routine of life that I'm just going to walk by faith and not by sight. I believe that God is wanting to do something to where we would actually grab a hold of it to where he is going to do something unexpected in our lives. The first time that I really kind of came into that level of living of low expectation, especially about holidays and birthdays, came when I graduated high school. I barely graduated high school, praise the Lord. And I thought, you know what, this whole school thing is not for me. I'm not going to go to college. I had no direction, no purpose, no drive in life. So I went and worked on a dairy for a year. I learned that that is not what I want to do the rest of my life. But what I learned doing that style of job is that you have to work on your birthday. Because cows always need to be milked. Twice a day. I had to, look, had to work the mornings of Christmas, the morning of Thanksgiving, the mornings of all these different holidays. And all of a sudden that expectation of what I used to think of all these holidays were all about all of a sudden just started to melt away. And I think that has happened to, to some of us here this morning, if not most of us. That the certain life experiences that we have faced in our life have kind of melted away the glitz and glamour and the joy and the celebration of these types of events, these types of times we come in and celebrate Christmas. It reminds me of a story about a young individual. He went and saw a fortune teller. I don't know if this still happens, so this is an old story. He went and saw a fortune teller and, and kind of asked, what is my future? And this lady held his hand, looked at his hand, and, and, and looked at it for a while, then peered into his eyes and says, you're going to be poor and miserable until you reach 41 years of age. Shocked, he said, what happens then? Am I going to become rich? And she looked back at him and said, no. You're just going to be accustomed to being poor and you're not going to be miserable any longer. 
And I wonder if that has happened to our life. After the dreams, after the things that, that seem to be what you wanted to do in life and, and the goals and, and that drive that you once had, has it dwindled away? No longer disappointed. I believe God wants to do the unexpected in our lives. Something that I've been able to, to just, I'm trying to, to learn more of, and I've, I've seen it in the scriptures, and I've seen it in other people's, people's lives, is that even though life may fail to meet our expectations, we should always expect God to do the unexpected. There's a, a verse, Job 5, in verse 9, in the message, and it says, After all, he's famous for great and unexpected acts. There's no end to his surprises. This message that I have for us this morning is expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected from God. What does that mean? That means that the, the worst day that you may be in, the worst day that you've ever faced in your life could be the very best day of your life when God gets a hold of it. That means the very worst season that you may be in, the struggles and the hardships that you may be going through this year, God can turn it around and be able to infuse it with his goodness, with his power, with the miraculous, and change it from the worst year of your life to the best year ever. And that, I believe, is what God is wanting to do in our lives. That he is wanting to change our expectations so that we would be able to expect the unexpected. No longer living in the mundane routine of life, but knowing that God has something special for me today. He has something special for me this year. Do you believe that? Do you have that level of faith to believe that even though things have not kind of panned out for me so far, I still believe in a God that is more than enough, that can do exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask, think, hope, or imagine. That that is the God that we serve. And I believe he wants to do something inside each and every one of our lives. And that is what took place in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. An unexpected event that was expected for centuries. It caught people by surprise, but had been prophesied for centuries. Centuries. That they knew the Messiah was going to come, but they weren't ready for him when he actually did. And I'm wondering about your life. The things that you once expected from God. Those things that you once were praying from God. Those things that you knew God had spoken into your life. Are you still expecting them? And what's going to take place when not God actually brings those words to pass? Because his words do not fail, Amen. Are we going to be ready for when the expected comes? Or is it going to be unexpected? Something I, I want us to kind of get as we go into this message, which I think is so amazing. I love it. Something in Matthew 2, verse 12. It's at the very end of this story. And this is something I want us to be able to see because I think so often you and I, we can kind of come in um, into these Sunday Christmas services and we hope to get a warm, fuzzy feeling and just kind of go back and go about our daily lives. But this, I think, is a word for each and every one of us. And I believe that there is going to be a word for each and every one of us in this message that's either going to come out of my mouth or going to be led by the Holy Spirit to, to kind of allow your mind to think and to travel and go down a trail where God is going to speak some, to something in your life. That God has a word for you. But Matthew 2, 12 says, Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Speaking of the wise men, when they came into contact with God, when they actually saw what was taking place and, and kind of the, the fruition of their whole travels, something changed in them. They, had, they were divinely warned and it says that they went home a different way. 
That you and I, every Sunday we come in here, we have the ability to come through those doors and we have the ability to either walk through those doors the same way that we came in or we can choose to walk out that way a different way. A different way than when we came in. And it's up to us. And I believe that is a warning from God. God's warning, warnings are not abusive, they're not controlling, but they're to set us up for success in life. Amen? So often we think that when God's warning is because he's angry, he's judgmental, all this kind of stuff, but he wants what is best for your life. And are you going to take heed and walk out that way a different way or are you going to go home the same way you came into town? These wise men went home a different way. And I think that was something amazing. And I think that's a word for us this morning. How they came in to Bethlehem. Something that we need to know about Bethlehem is that is still somewhat true for today is that it was a small and insignificant town. That not too much happened in Bethlehem, that it was primarily known for, uh, Bethlehem is the house of bread, so it was known for their grain produce, and it was known for sheep, something of an agricultural town, something that we probably wouldn't understand. Small, insignificant. But something, if you actually study the Bible and start to dive into looking through Bethlehem, you'll discover that Jacob, who was later named Israel, buried His wife, Rachel, Jacob married two wives, Leah first and then Rachel. It's an awkward story. But the one whom he loved, Rachel, that's where he buried her, was in in Bethlehem. Another story that took place in Bethlehem was the story of Ruth and Boaz. Where Ruth, a widowed foreigner, comes into town and meets this man, meets Boaz, and they fall in love. And he starts to care for her and he eventually marries her and takes care of her. Bethlehem is the birthplace of David. The man that the Bible says is the man after God's own heart. Before he was a king, before he was even anointed king, he was a lowly shepherd boy out in the pastures in Bethlehem. Why am I sharing that about Bethlehem? Because I want us to hear this morning that even though you think that your life is small and insignificant, God can do an amazing thing in your life. Because this town that was small and insignificant was the very place that God wanted to be able to bring his true love into this world. His power, his redemption, his plan of forgiveness and purpose for humanity. And that is what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. That God has a plan and purpose for each and every one of us, amen? That he has directions for our life. And I want us to go into this story and look what is so amazing about what took place with these wise men. Where they were brought to a place of unexpected joy. What they were able to do in the process, in the journeys of life that we would be able to follow and be able to begin again to expect God to do the unexpected in our life. First thing I want us to, to answer this morning is what are you seeking? What are you seeking? Matthew 2, 1 through 3 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. One of the major reasons I think that we have lost our expectation in life or in the holidays is that we're pursuing the wrong things. We're going after the wrong things. Things that maybe we once knew what the right things were, what God ordained in our life to follow, but sooner or later we kind of got off the path that God had for our lives. That we started pursuing the wisdom of man or, or the riches and all these different things that, that can be 
so um, awe-inspiring and going after different gadgets, different things, especially during Christmas, it can become so commercialized in our lives. And that's what we think brings um, the, the, the fulfillment of the holiday spirit is getting the right present or giving the right present. Spending the time making sure that all our family is together. If, that, if only we could have our family together, then we would be happy. If only this would take place in our lives, if only this would happen during Christmas, then my life would be good. But something that we see here, something that they were seeking, that they were pursuing in life, they were pursuing the right thing. Something that you need to know about the book of Matthew is that the author of Matthew throughout the whole entire, his whole entire gospel, what he is doing is he's trying to point that this person, this Jesus, this, this man child that, that came into the world was the actual king from the line of David. So what these people, they were not pursuing the star. They're not seeking the star and the star's origin. What was taking place is that they were seeking, they were pursuing the newborn king. They were pursuing a king. And that's what brought them to Jerusalem. They knew that throughout probably old biblical prophecies in, in Numbers where, where there was Balaam the prophet. I don't want to get into it it's too much. But he prophesied one day. And so we can, we can kind of think that these people are, are pretty smart. That they were masters of studying the stars because they were some type of astrologies or astronomers of some type. And that they were able to follow the star because they saw something different and they were studying scriptures from, from a far off land and they knew that there was something about this. And what's so amazing about that is I think that God can speak to anyone in their life context. That these people that were worldly, these people that were foreigners, these people that were not a part of God's chosen people were able to get a, a, a desire and a passion to search out this new king through what they were practicing and some think that it was somewhat demonic for looking for answers in the stars and astrology like some people do today with the different signs. But God was able to speak into their life context and bring a change and to bring a desire for them to start seeking something. That God can do that in each and every one of our lives. That God can come into our life and use an ordinary situation and turn it into an extraordinary life-changing event. That God can do that in our lives, but do you believe it? So they went searching in hopes to find this new king of, uh, of the Jews in Jerusalem, the capital city, to the palace. But when they got to the palace, they were disappointed. They expected to meet the newborn king in a palace, in the capital, in Jerusalem, and they were disappointed. Something that is profound that I think that takes place is that even when they didn't find him there, they kept going. In your pursuit of, of, of God, in your pursuit of walking out what he has for you, in your pursuit of fulfillment in life and coming up to disappointment, because I know we've all faced disappointment. Has that stopped you in your tracks to no longer pursue anything, to pursue God, pursue what he has for your life? Or maybe you're kind of that pushed you and that stopped you in a way in, in your life and you're just kind of pursuing the temporary things, the temporal things, the things of this world, the things like clothes or, or, or money or relationships, finances, the right job, the right house. Are you still seeking for purpose? Are you still seeking what you were seeking initially, seeking the king of kings? What are we seeking this Christmas? Is it seeking something that meets my desires, my wants, something that's for me and mine? The wise men, they came into contact with this guy who was the king of that time named Herod. And this was a very evil king if you wanna look into history 
anyone that tried, that, that, that he thought was going to dethrone him or could possibly dethrone him, he had killed. His wife, his mother-in-law, to some that might not be that bad, I'm just playing. Three of his kids and a score of other people. His third son that he had killed was five days before he died. Knowing that death was at his doorstop, he still thought that this son of his was going to be a threat to his throne and he had him killed. Something that takes place after our scripture is that, that we see that he, he kind of knew from the wise men when the star appeared. So he knew that how old Jesus was to be. So all your nativity sets are wrong. The wise men were not there. He was about two years old or, or like a year, year to two years old. And so we had all the babies or all the children that were born in Bethlehem from two years old down murdered. Why am I talking about this? is sometimes we can be Herod. We can have the focus on ourselves. We can try and have, have these holidays focused on me and mine. It's, it's what I have. It's what I need. It's what I want. We want to be the king of our life. Are you making Jesus the king of your life? The king of this season? Is Christmas about me? Is Christmas about us? Christmas time for the wise men was an opportunity to worship the new king. Are we taking time this Christmas season to worship Jesus with our lives? To continually seek him, to seek after him? Is, are we using it to kind of um, bring up our level of expectation that we once had to be able to seek him in a new way. What are you seeking next? Where are you searching? Matthew 2, four through six says, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. What gets me every time when I read this scripture, whether it's in a daily reading plan or whether it's during the, the holiday season, is when these religious elite, these scribes, these Pharisees, these people that, that knew all the prophecies, they knew what was going to take place. They knew what was, what was going to happen. They were asked about this event and they gave them the right answer. They knew where this child that would be the Messiah was to be born. But it did not move them into action to actually go pursuing him. They knew all the right answers. But there was still something inside of them that didn't push them into actually going and searching in the right place. But they stayed where they were. There's a lot of people that know church. They know Christianity. They know the routines. They know what's expected of them. But has that knowledge actually moved into their life to push them into a life of faith? It's not being submitted, knowing, having knowledge, being able to have that knowledge just for my head, just so I can be prideful, just so that I can use those scriptures against someone else. But are we actually going into God's word to find wisdom for life transformation? They just had it just for themselves to make themselves wise, to be able to be looked up to by other people, but it didn't change their lifestyle. Something that is so amazing, I think that is, that is they found the answer. They eventually found their answer. And where was it at? It was in God's word. It was in the scriptures. 
And even though it, they caused them to, to cause disappointment in their life of what they expected, where they were expecting to go, that the answer came in God's word, that it came in the scriptures. And I know it might sound too old school, it might sound too Christian, it might sound too simple for some, but are you making time for reading your word? For getting answers, for getting direction for your life. They got direction for their life to where Jesus was, who he was through the scriptures. They found direction for hope, for direction for forgiveness, direction for life in the scripture. Are we making time for God's word? Just because we may know something to be true doesn't mean it's invaded our heart and moved us to faith in Christ. Just because we know this may be the right thing, we know the Bible's true, is it actually moving us into faith to really studying things out, believing it, having it impact our lives so it's changing the way we live, changing the way we act, changing how we have relationships with other people, changing how we think when we're at our workplace, changing how we use our finances? Are we allowing God's word and Holy Spirit to bring conviction and change into our lives? Something that, that, I, that I think that we kind of get a mis mis misconception about when, when conviction comes is like, we don't want to be wrong. I don't want other people to see me. I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't want to, to I don't want to be, have that wrong attitude. I don't want to be wrong in, in how I'm living. So I'm just going to keep going and going, even though conviction comes. What conviction is, is God is wanting to set you up for success that he's trying to stop you in a certain direction because it's leading you down a path of destruction. And when we get conviction from the Holy Spirit, it brings us and changes us and realigns our purpose, realigns our, our direction in life. So if you get convicted on a Sunday morning, don't be scared to come up and ask for prayer by somebody. God is wanting to do something in your life. And I know it could be, might be humiliating, but God's, God, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, the Bible says. So maybe you need to ask someone else, maybe you need to confess something to someone else, that God is wanting to change our lives and transform our lives into what he wants to do. A life of purpose, a life of meaning, a life of fulfillment. Are we allowing our lives to move in faith? Not just trying to gain some head knowledge, but actually allowing it to transform our life and move us into faith. The wise men set their hearts to searching. Where are you searching this morning? Where are you searching for hope? Where are you searching for meaning? Is it in a relationship? Is it at your job? Just, I wish I had more money. I need more money. Is that where you're searching for meaning, for hope? Maybe an education. Is that where you're searching? Are you searching in the right place this morning? See, the wise men, they set their hearts to searching. Searching in spite of disappointments, in spite of what others were saying, in spite of what culture was doing, they still kept searching. Are you still searching for Jesus or have you given up the search because of disappointment and just given in to other things around you? I wrote some ideas of, of where we could be searching, where we can find ourselves searching all the different directions. We can, we can search at talk shows, media, the latest gadgets and devices. We can look to our job, look to our family, look to Fox News or CNN. We can even look to our culture. But are we looking to God's word, finding direction for our lives? Even though their expectation led to disappointment, they kept searching. I know that all of us have faced disappointments, but has that stopped us? searching for Jesus. The Bible says to keep seeking. 
Keep knocking. And eventually the door will be open to us. Jeremiah, I think it's, if you seek me with all your heart, have you stepped into the next level of seeking and searching with your whole heart? Because that's when we'll find him. Matthew 2, 9 says, when they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Sometimes searching for Jesus takes departing from what the world finds valuable. They had to leave the palace, leave their old expectations behind. And when they found the answer in God's word, in scripture, they left that, they departed that and they kept searching. They kept pursuing something different, kept pursuing. And when they actually left, it says that somehow the star reappeared for them. Something that they saw take place. They saw the star rising in the east. And when they came to Jerusalem, disappointment, low expectations. They weren't met. All of a sudden they left that. They found an answer again and they left that. And all of a sudden the star reappeared to them and brought them exactly to Jesus, the Bible says. Sometimes searching Finding that answer is departing from some things in your life. Departing from what the world deems as valuable, worldly wisdom, that he left the palace, he left where all the things were taking place for that area of life, left that culture, and they departed that, and that's when that star came back and pointed them to the right place. What are some things that this season of life that you need to depart from? to be able to get back on the right path that God has for you? What are some things that could be hindering your life from pursuing Jesus this season? From being able to expect the unexpected that he has for us, to expect God to do a mighty work in our lives? Are we still stuck in some issues, stuck in some things that God has told you to step away from long ago? What are you pursuing? Searching God's word brings direction to treat Jesus, direction to hope, direction to fulfillment, direction to forgiveness. What are you willing to give? Matthew 2, 11 says, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Throughout the Bible, we see that giving is an expression of worship. Whenever there was a time that someone worshiped God in the Bible, that there was a time of giving. We see that the wise men in their act of worship was manifested in their giving. Worship comes from the value of what something is worth. Does anybody know what the motto of Hallmark cards are? when you care enough to give the very best. That's God's motto. Because he cared enough to give the very best. That is true agape love, God love, that he would give the very best for us to humanity. And that is what he's asking us, to love God, to worship God, is to give him our very best. The level of our expectation is directly related to what you are willing to give. What are you willing to give? What are you willing to give? Matthew 2.11 speaks of the wise men. It says that they opened up their treasure and they presented gifts to him. This doesn't speak of, 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 of some little box of gold like we're so accustomed to seeing or some box of frankincense and myrrh. It's talking about a treasure, a great retinue that there was, there was probably a lot of, I mean, it's gonna be a lot of people, a lot of camels. It's that they opened up their treasure. They opened, what, what about our lives? Are we opening ourselves up and giving God our best? Opening up our treasure opening up our heart, opening up our life and giving him our gifts.
speaking of an overflow of worship, it's giving, it's generosity. We were praying last night that we, our church, would be generous this season, that we would be generous, that we would be able to give our very best. I know many times when, when I think I've preached this message on this, and I'm sure my dad has, and there's so many more, that, that when we read this, we, we, we kind of break it down to the different symbolisms and analogies of what these gifts could be. The gold, the frankincense, and myrrh. The gold represents kingship, represents faith. The frankincense kind of can represent prayer or the priesthood. Myrrh represents sacrifice and suffering. All these things are great. All these things point to to Jesus' life and what would take place in his life and his death. But we can kind of overlook all these analogies or overlook overlook the reality and focus on the symbolisms and analogies when actuality, what is taking place is that they are giving. They are giving. A life of worship is a life of giving. Someone once said, if you haven't given God something, then you haven't worshiped. So what do we give? What do we give as worship? We give praise, honor, thanks, ourselves, our hearts, our lives, our money, everything, yes to all those. But there's one thing that if it's missing, then it's not worship. I've already mentioned it. That one thing that is true worship is giving our very best. It's not giving God leftovers. It's giving God our best. Are we giving God our best time throughout the day to spend with him? Are we giving God just leftovers of maybe some change we have in our pocket? Or are we giving him our best? Are we giving him our, get, get our best praise and adoration or just some, some leftover time that we may have in the evening when we're already tired. God wants us to be able to give our very best. When we give and open up ourselves, open up our treasure, open up our hearts, and we give of ourselves of our very best, that is when we can begin to expect the unexpected that God wants to open and do in our lives, amen? That is what God has for our lives that he is famous for doing the unexpected. So this morning, my heart's desire is that you would ask Holy Spirit to convict you in some areas, to show you, am I seeking the right thing? Am I searching in the right place? And am I willing to give my very best? We're gonna have the worship team come up. We're gonna close, but you guys can all stand up. We're gonna sing one more song, but I want you to be open for what Holy Spirit wants to pinpoint in your life. Maybe some areas that you've been seeking, those areas that maybe you've been searching in that are totally wrong. Maybe in giving of whatever it might be. that we would be attentive, that we would be open because God wants to do something unexpected in our lives, amen? That we would be able to live by faith and not by sight. And I think that too often, many of us are still walking throughout life just by what we see. And we've allowed our faith to kind of dwindle down with our low expectations of what holidays can be about, what our Christian life can be about, what maybe our relationships with our spouse can be about, our careers can be about, that God wants to be able to touch different areas of our life and to be able to bring the miraculous. Just like that we've seen recently in our prayer chain, 
that those individuals have been able to be touched by God. God wants to touch your life. Do you believe that this morning? He wants to touch you in your heart, touch you in your mind, touch you in your body, touch you in your relationships, touch you in your marriage, touch you in your finances, that he wants to touch and bring about an expectation that is dwindled away to being unexpected.